the morning forefront. Almost don't recognize that guy. A few, a few things have changed, you know. Um, but it is my honor to be with you guys this morning. Uh, happy Memorial Day this weekend. And uh, obviously, thank you to all the veterans that have served our country. Um, you know, I look at that video and I'm like, wow, nine, that was nine and a half years ago. So those of you guys who know my daughter, who in that video I mentioned being just a few weeks old, and now uh, she's grown quite a bit since then. Uh, I've lost quite a bit of hair since then. Uh, so things change. Uh, but as much as some things change, some things stay the same, right? Um, and so it's good to get a reminder of our stories sometimes and, uh, and where we came from. Um, I actually hadn't seen that video in several years. Uh, and then last weekend on Friday night, I don't know if you guys know this, but the elders and Pastor Drew and Tyler and some of the spouses and kids, we got away for a little retreat up in the mountains. So we got away for the night. Uh, and during that retreat, uh, we started watching some videos of some stuff from back and forefront. And, uh, and then we ended up playing that one. And someone suggested, you know what, you should do that as your sermon intro. And it seems to actually fit pretty well with the topic we're going with today. So I decided we'd go ahead and show that as a way to introduce myself. So uh, my name is Justin. At that point, we were new to Forefront. We hadn't been going very long. We just started getting involved. I joined a life group that was, um, actually the leader of that life group was Pastor Brett, our previous lead pastor here. Uh, and so I joined his life group and I started serving on the sign team because when you meet in a school, it's really important to get signs out so people know that it's a church on Sunday, not just a school, right? Uh, and so I joined the sign team and so I was serving in those capacities and uh, was pretty new to the church, but just connected enough for them to know a little bit about my story and my transplant and stuff. And so, you know, I got tapped on the shoulder and asked if I'd make a video for it. So uh, that was actually part of a video series uh, for us for the Christmas uh, series that year. Uh, about nine and a half years ago. Um, and so mine was love. There was also one on uh, joy and peace and hope and stuff like that as we led into that time. Uh, so it's kind of cool to see that um, and really just honored to have been new to the church back then and continue to grow in the church now. Today, I'm honored to be one of your elders here at Forefront Church at Harvey Park. Uh, and so that's just a great role and an honor to be able to serve as one of the overseers of the church. Also honored to get to speak with you guys today. Now, if you guys remember earlier in the spring, the last time I was up here sharing a message, a little different circumstance. That was when uh, Pastor Drew was sick on a Sunday morning. So I got a call in the morning and was like, you know, you almost don't know if this is a joke when this happens, right? But it's like, hey, can you fill in for me? And I was like, sure. And he was like, okay, you can just preach one of your messages or you can use my notes. And I was like, send me your notes, right? And so uh, prepared that way. A little different circumstance. So I am happy to report that Pastor Drew is on vacation with his family. Uh, kids finish school this week. And so they're, they're taking a little time off, which I think is important for pastors to do, right? Like get away and refresh a little bit. Uh, so glad to report this was a planned Sunday morning for me to be up here, uh, not just a last minute uh, jump up here and try to deliver a message. Now, I was tempted to say no when I was asked though, because... Uh, just the timing. Um, as you guys know, I'm a teacher, or maybe you don't know that, but I'm a middle school science teacher, uh, and my kids just finished on Thursday, and the eighth graders had their continuation ceremony Thursday night. I went in Friday, cleaned out my room, and got everything cleaned up, uh, because tomorrow morning, my wife and daughter and I are meeting a group of students at the school at 5.30 in the morning tomorrow morning, uh, so that we can take a bus out to DIA and fly to San Diego, and I take a group of students to uh, Sea Camp, which is like a marine education camp that they get to go to out in San Diego. So excited for that, but between the end of the year and that, and being asked to pre in between, I was like, I don't know if this is a good idea. But I looked at my calendar. I'm also not only a teacher, I'm a student, but I noticed I was on a two-week break from grad school, and I was like, all right, let's do it. So I'm here. Hopefully I'm prepared. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but ultimately I accepted because I was excited about this series. Pastor Drew told me, you know, it was before the uh, God of the Promise series had started, and he was talking about the idea of this, that we're going to spend seven weeks, uh, this is the fifth week of it, that we're going to spend seven weeks walking through some of these promises that God has made to us. And this idea that when we see God, not just as a promise maker, but as a promise keeper, it makes him more trustworthy for us. And when we can see that God, and when we can cling on to or stand on the foundation of those promises, it allows us to trust in God more and grow deeper in our faith and move forward. So I love that concept. And so when he asked me to be a part of that, I was like, you know, I should say yes. That's a great, great opportunity to share God's word with you guys um, and a great topic to do it. So uh, we're going to be jumping around a little bit today. You'll notice I didn't leave you a lot of room for notes because there's two main passages that we're going to be jumping between. Uh, but I wanted to get them both on the notes just because we are jumping back and forth. So feel free to follow along in your Bibles, your Bible apps or whatever. But because we're going to be spending part of the time in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and then we're going to be jumping over to Romans chapter 6. And because we'll be jumping back and forth a lot, I thought it was better to uh, put them both on there so you could see them all in one place if, if you'd prefer to follow along there. Now, these two different passages, these are both examples where the Apostle Paul is writing to the early church. Uh, in one example, in Romans, he's writing to the church in Rome and the new believers there. 
In the other example, 2 Corinthians, uh, it's interesting because in our Bible we call it 2 Corinthians, but it's known to be at least the fourth letter that Paul wrote to the church, and Corinth was the capital of a region which is now modern-day Greece, right? And so in that area there was a church in Rome, which of course was during the Roman Empire, now modern-day Italy. Both these areas the church was growing, and Paul was trying to write to them to communicate in these passages about one of God's promises for them. And so the promise I want to share with you guys today comes from these passages, and I want to share it with you guys. Hopefully uh, I can use Paul's words for a lot of that because he did a pretty good job of communicating it to the early church. So if you guys want to follow along with that, I would invite you guys to join us there. And really the premise here, we're building on the other promises, right? So week one, Pastor Drew tried to lay the foundation of where we're going with this series, right? This idea that we can hang on to these promises and have a good foundation. And so the first week was really just about how God's promise to be with us, right? And then the second week, we moved on to the promise of forgiveness and uh, really that idea that we are forever free and forever forgiven. And I think the line that stood out to me in that one was uh, this idea that we can't re-earn God's forgiveness because we never earned it in the first place, right? Uh, but understanding that promise is going to be important to understanding today's promise, okay? So understand the promise of forgiveness. Of course, on uh, Mother's Day, it was the promise of the Holy Spirit. And then last week, the promise of God's blessings. And he reminded us that we need to lean on the promises of God in order to change our perspective and see, that, and see oneself as blessed, right? That overflowing with Jesus. And so we have those promises, but the promise I want to look at today is God's promise to make us new. God's promise to make us new. And I think we see this worded a few different ways uh, in Scripture. Uh, we're going to talk about being a new creation today. We're going to talk about living new life. Uh, there's other parts of the Bible where it talks about being born again, right, into new life. Uh, but God makes this promise multiple times throughout the Bible, this promise to make us new. And uh, we're going to focus on two passages where Paul knew that was important to communicate to the early church. Uh, I think it's also important for us to look at it today. Uh, so if you guys would join me, I do want to read together uh, from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're just going to read verses 16 and 17 together, but if you guys would join me in reading that, uh, starting in verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Church, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hey, let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for this morning. Uh, we thank you for the people here at Forefront Church at Harvey Park, uh, the chance to worship you together this morning, uh, the chance to dig into your promises, God, that we can hang on to them and build our faith with them. Uh, thank you for this Memorial Day weekend. And of course, uh, let us not forget the, what we celebrate with Memorial Day as we look to our veterans and those who serve and those who uh, give us a chance to be in a free country. Uh, give us a chance to freely assemble to worship God in a church like this. And we just thank you for that opportunity and all those who, uh, who have served to allow us to be in a country that we are free. Uh, God, we thank you for your promises. We thank you for all the promises that we're covering in this series and all the 7,000 of them that are throughout your Bible, Lord. Uh, we just, uh, just pray that we would hang on to those, uh, that we would uh, be able to grow in faith because of them. Obviously, we want to lift up Pastor Drew and his family as they travel and as they're on vacation. I uh, just pray that it would be a refreshing time for them uh, so that he can come back energized and ready to continue to pour out uh, in such a sacrificial way as he does to lead our church. Uh, and also, God, this morning, I just pray for your words, Lord, that you would help me to, uh, to share your message, God, uh, and that uh, you give me your words just to communicate, God, and you give us hearts to receive the message you have for us this morning. We ask all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, guys, so the main verse there, right? Did you guys catch that there? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. God has promised to make us new, and we see that right here, that he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And I think this is, and cognitively it's easy to say, like, hey, if you're in Jesus, you're new. I think that's easy to say, but I think a lot of Christians, we struggle with this idea. Like, what's it look like to be new? How's, how's that work? Um, I think sometimes that's, that's a little bit tough. You know, one thing I like about that intro video is, well, one, obviously, I reminisce a little bit, right? It's always fun to see yourself nearly a decade ago, a younger version of yourself. Uh, so I like that aspect of it, but what I also like is it's a good reminder for me of my story and the parts of it where I had hope and I had faith and I was able to grow in that. And so during that time, it was, uh, it was clear that my life was being changed by needing a kidney transplant, right? And I was recounting that story. Uh, 
And that can be a scary time if you guys, different people go through different health scares at different times, right? We know that can be kind of a scary time. And sometimes there can be despair with that. And there was the promise through doctors and through medical science of the hope of a new life in terms of restoring my health. But what I love about that story is actually how God used those same circumstances to help reconcile me back to him. That God used that opportunity not just to say, hey, doctors might heal you physically, but I want to heal you spiritually, right? I want to give you new life and try to do that. And so when I read this, I think about being a new creation, trying to move from knowing about Jesus as I did, having some head knowledge, right, to actually knowing Jesus and trusting him. And that's a big difference, right? We can know about God. We all have an opinion about Jesus, right? Some of us trust in him and believe in him. Some of us think he's just a historical figure. Some of us might think great things or negative things about him, but we all have an opinion there. But it's one thing to know about Jesus. It's another thing to try to know him, right? And I think that's where I moved in that time in my life. And so God orchestrated things. Now, my story is a long story. Some of you guys may have a different story. You may remember a time when someone presented the gospel to you and you accepted it right there and it was a very quick thing and you can point to a single moment. Mine, you know, maybe I'm a slow learner. I had to read a whole book and be praying and try to figure out and finally get to the point where I trusted God. So, Whatever that is, we have different stories. I'm sure there's some people in here who are still in the middle of their story. Maybe you don't trust Jesus yet. Maybe you're still investigating those things. Maybe you're trying to discover them, and that's fine as well. But for all of us, wherever we are in our story, I want us to look at this idea of being a new creation because we should understand what God's telling us when he says, if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. And he means new, new, right? Like brand new. In fact, I titled this uh, sermon, you look at the top there, it's going to say, A Brand New You, right? And I think, when I think of this, I always think, like, recently, my wife and I, we bought a new car. And by new car, I mean new to us. So we'd be talking about, we're excited, we bought a new car. And people are like, well, is it brand new? And we're like, no. It's a few model years old with some miles on it. I wanted to save thousands of dollars, right? I didn't want to buy a brand new car. So it's not brand new, right? And so I think sometimes that's how we think in life. Like, oh, it's going to be a new me. It'll be an upgrade. It'll be an improved version. No, God's saying a brand new you. Like the newest model that you can't even imagine the features that are going to come on it, right? Like totally different. And so I don't think we always relate to that the right way. This is an incredible promise, but there's a few truths I'd like for us to uncover today so that we can understand what God has promised us. And so we can understand what does this look like? How does this happen? What's it meant, what's meant by being a new creation? Uh, so we're going to jump through. We're going to walk through both these passages today. We're going to pull out some truths, try to uncover some stuff. Uh, so I actually want to start a couple verses before the one we read together, back in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 14 this time. So at the top of your, uh, your sheets there. And it says right there in verse 14, For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one, that being Jesus, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he, being Jesus, died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So the first truth I want us to uncover today when we learn about the promise of being made new is the fact that it is based on what God has done for us through Jesus. It's based on what God did for us through Jesus. It's not based on us. We don't get to just decide, hey, I'm going to be a new me. No, the reason we can do this is it's based on the work God's already done on our behalf through Jesus. And so I think we need to see that there, that the one died for all, right? And so we see that in the passage there. Uh, this is a promise from God that we're going to be a new creation. It's really a gift from God that we get to become a new creation. And it's only possible because Jesus died on the cross. The second truth I see as we start into this passage here, and that I want us to understand about the promise, is that we were made for a purpose, and that purpose is to live for Jesus. We're made for a purpose. So when we read in here, it says in verse 15, he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him, live for Jesus, right? Who for their sake died and was raised. So when we look at this idea of being new, let's start with the foundational piece here. It's based on what Jesus did, and it's for the purpose of living for him. So we're not just new because we want to be new and shiny, brand new, brand new car. It's because we're doing it for a purpose. Another verse that supports this, if you guys jump down to that Romans chapter 6 uh, passage on your notes, starting in chapter 3, it says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And again, that new creation idea, right? 
The Second Corinthians 1 told us a new creation here. It's talking about us walking in newness of life. That idea that this promise that we can be made new. But I look at that and I remember being baptized myself. One of the cool things of being an elder is I've gotten to baptize some people as well, right? And it's always a cool event in someone's life to mark that point of saying, hey, I made a decision for Jesus. Now I'm going to publicly show that. But there's so much symbolism in that, right? Just as we know, so this idea that when we go into the water, just like we're being buried with Jesus, right? We're associating with his death. But luckily for us, it wasn't just Jesus' death because then we'd stand under the water a long time, right? But it was his death, burial, and resurrection. And the resurrection of Jesus is that idea of us coming back out of the water into new life, getting to be a new you. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. It's a great imagery, right? And it really, the idea of baptism supports this promise of being made new. So we get to walk in newness of life to no longer live for ourselves, but live for Jesus. We're going to jump back over to our main passage in 2 Corinthians, now picking up at verse 16, which is where the little break is there on your notes. And it says there in 2 Corinthians, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Now, there's some debate on this if you read about uh, commentaries on this, right? So, uh, that last part where it says, even though we regarded Christ according to the flesh, some scholars would say uh, that's Paul's perspective, right? Because if you know the history there, Paul, who was formerly Saul, right? Like he, he was a persecutor of the church, right? And so in that, he regarded Jesus according to the flesh, meaning Paul once regarded Jesus as a false prophet or a false messiah, right? So some people would say that's what Paul's writing here. Other people would say it's actually referring to the fact that Jesus had to come down from heaven to earth and walk among people and walk in the flesh. And even though he was fully God, he became fully human at that time. So there can be some different opinions on that second part. But the first part of that verse, I think, is pretty clear. We regard no one according to the flesh. And I think this is an important idea because when we look at the truths of being made new, I think the next truth we should really internalize and understand about this is the idea that as a new creation, we are no longer slaves to our old selves. We are no longer reg regarded according to the flesh. We're no longer slaves to our old self. And I think this is an important thing to hear about this because it's one thing to say, hey, I get to be new, but it's another thing to understand, but the old has passed away and accept that part of it. As long as we're holding on to the old part of us, it's going to be hard to truly be new, right? And so we need to make that transition there and think about that. If we go back into the Romans uh, chapter 6, if, starting in verse 5 this time, it says, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, that means Jesus and his death on the cross. So if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. I think those are some powerful words. Now, in the Bible, whenever it talks about the flesh, like regarded by the flesh, really what it's talking about is like our natural selves, our human nature, our physical being, right? And we got to remember we are both a physical and a spiritual being, right? But the flesh is weak. The flesh is what is tempted by sin, which is... Uh, falls into those things, right? Uh, I always think of examples. Uh, even recently, my dog scratched my flesh. My flesh was pretty weak, right? Like it <laughs> bled all over the place. Like the flesh is not strong. But what we're seeing here is, yes, we had a physical birth when we came into this world. But what God's more concerned with is our spiritual rebirth. So we can have a physical birth in life. In fact, you're all here, so you were born, right? Good news. Uh, but that isn't what God's as concerned with. And so we're no longer regarded by that old physical self. God's worried about the new creation of your spiritual self. And so we need to look at that distinction there. So we're spiritual beings. You know, uh, when I was getting my kidney transplant, one of the things that came up is this idea, the doctors kept saying this idea that kidney transplant is a treatment, it's not a cure, right? So even as a kidney transplant recipient, that is a treatment that I'm undergoing. I'm not cured. I still have kidney disease. I still have some of the issues associated with that. I will forever be taking handfuls of pills in the morning and the evening. They have been a lot of medication for that. When you guys notice me shaking a lot sometimes, that's a result of being under treatments for kidney disease, right? Like there's still side effects. There's different things that happen with that. I think sometimes people think I'm super nervous, which I do get nervous when I come up and talk, but it's exaggerated by the fact that I'm under treatment for having kidney disease, right? 
And so part of that treatment is I have someone else's organ. Both of my kidneys died. I got one new one, but it's a treatment. It's not a cure. And I think sometimes the same thing happens in our Christian walk, right? Now, we wish, and at least I wish, that as soon as we accepted Jesus, we just got to go zap right up to heaven, right? Like, hey, Jesus, I want to be with you. Boom, take me there. But he has a purpose for us staying here. And while we're here, we're going to have this struggle of trying to let ourselves no longer be slaves to sin and slaves to our flesh while trying to live a new spiritual life to live with God, and we live in that tension. Now, spoiler alert, I've read the end of the book, and Jesus wins in the end, okay? So if we know that, we know one day we will be restored to perfect, a perfect cure, right? There'll be no tears, there'll be no pain. If you read Revelations, a beautiful picture of where we end up. So we know that's the end of the story. But I think sometimes the reason why we struggle with this idea of newness of life is because we're still here. And so we need to know, and I think for a lot of us, because we go through seasons where we struggle with the passions of the flesh, we struggle with these ideas. We want to be a new creation in Jesus. We want to live a spiritual life, but we still struggle with the physical reality of our world and the temptations, the different stuff we deal with. And so I think we need to hold on to this truth. Not only did God promise to make us new, but a truth of that is we are no longer slaves to our old self. And some of us need to hear that because if we keep acting like we're slaves to our old self, we're going to struggle to ever be the new creation that God has designed us to be. And so that's part of God's word right here. He's telling us we have died with Jesus, right? That baptism is that symbolism of it. It says right here in his word, right, it talks about how uh, we were crucified with him in order that the body of sin would be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. That's a truth from God's word. But it's hard for us to take the promise of new life when we're still hanging on to the old life. So yes, we're physical beings. And I wish accepting Jesus meant I got to go zap right up to be in glory with him. That'd be awesome. But we know the end of the story. We know ultimately we get that cure. But in the meantime, while we struggle in this world, can we look to this promise and grab onto it and make it a firm foundation for us that I don't have to be enslaved to my old self. I am free from that and I can work on being a new spiritual being that gets to live with Jesus and for Jesus. And I encourage you guys to take heart for that. So we are no longer slaves to our old selves. Now if we continue in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 17, this is kind of our main verse here. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, right? I think that's why that's in there, the idea we're no longer slaves to our old selves, right? The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now, I think when we look at this passage, we see a few key things here, right? That God is reconciling us to ourselves. Because we are in the flesh, we are separated from God. We are created in, God, in the image of God, right? To be in right relationship with him. But because of sin in this world, we are separated from God. But God wants to reconcile us back to him, right? Bring us back. Uh, the mission at Forefront Church is helping people find their way back to God. And sometimes people think that's weird phrasing, back to God, because they're like, well, I never knew God in the first place. Well, we say it that way because it's back to God because you were created in God's image. And that's what we're trying to come back to. And when sin separates us from that, there's a divide there but we can be reconciled back to God through what Jesus has done for us, right? And so that's what it's saying here is we have this mission of reconciliation, that God is trying to reconcile us back to him. It even says they're not counting their trespasses against them. That was really that promise from week two, right? The promise of forgiveness. We are forgiven. It's based on what Jesus did. We are forgiven, so we can come back. If God looked at me, he would see the sin in my life and I wouldn't be able to approach him, right? But when I come to God in prayer, I come in the name of Jesus because I want him to look on Jesus and that he's closed that gap for me. That I can now be in a right relationship with God. I can come pray God. I can ask things of God the Father in the name of Jesus because that's the reconciling work that Jesus did for us. So I think the next truth we need to see as we read through this passage is the idea that as new creations, we are called to be ambassadors of Christ. We have this message of reconciliation and we are called to be ambassadors of it. In fact, I'm pretty sure this is the reason why we don't just zap right up to heaven, right? It's because we are called to be ambassadors for Christ. 
We have work to do. We have the message of reconciliation. We have a message of how to be in right relationship with God, and we're supposed to share that. This is an individual challenge and a collective challenge as a church. Forefront Church, we exist as a community, as a collective, to help people find their way back to God. That's what we are called to. You individually in your life, if you have been reconciled to God, then you are called to be an ambassador for God with that message of reconciliation. So I encourage you guys to think about that and why we're here. On our own, we're never going to be in right relationship with God. But thankfully, we can be because of what God has done. And so we have this promise from God to make us new. And we're being made new based on what God has done for us through Jesus. We're being made new uh, for the purpose of living for Jesus. As a new creation, we're no longer slaves to our old selves. As a new creation, we're called to be ambassadors for Christ. But the final truth, which I think is essential here for us to understand all this, and it's kind of the underpinning here, is that we understand that this promise comes with a qualifier or with a condition. In fact, everywhere we see it, there's a conditional phrase there. It starts off in the 2 Corinthians version of if anyone is in Christ, right? So this is a promise God made, but he made it to you if you are in Christ. You know, when we look in the Romans 6 version, it says, if we have died with Christ. If we have died with Christ. Uh, If you look at the New Living Translation version of 2 Corinthians uh, 5.17, it says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ, right? So the promise is for anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has been gone. And so this is a great promise from God that he can make us new. But there is a condition attached. This is a promise for those who are in Jesus, for those who have died with him, who have accepted that and been reconciled back to God. So I think the most important question we can ask today is, are you in Christ? Is that a decision you've made? Some of us have made that decision. Some of us are maybe thinking about that decision. Some of us are different places in life, but that's probably the most important question we can ask ourselves because this is a beautiful promise from God but it's a promise that comes with a condition. It's for those who have accepted Jesus. And these verses here tell us about being reconciled to God. We need to understand there is a divide that if it wasn't for that promise of forgiveness, we would never be able to be back in right relationship. We'd never be able to be reconciled to God. So have we made that choice? Are we going to accept this promise? Back in week two, Pastor Drew gave this great illustration of gift cards, right? He talked about how gift cards are like a $130 billion industry, and yet every year there's billions of dollars of gift cards that go unused. So we have this promise from God. We have this amazingly valuable gift card sitting there if we are willing to use it, if we are in Christ. You know, this, uh, this topic came up in an interesting conversation in the Bible. It records, uh, uh, if you guys want to read the whole chapter, you can see it in John chapter 3. But Jesus was talking about this idea of becoming new. And he talked about being born again, right? And I don't know if you guys remember this story in the Bible, but there's this Pharisee, and his name is Nicodemus. Nic- uh, Nic- wow, totally lost it. Nicodemus, there we go. Uh, Nicodemus, he's talking to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was a Pharisee. And while he was a Jewish leader, right, a Pharisee, he was the one who was kind of like, wait, maybe there's something here. So he was interested and he was engaging in Jesus' conversation, trying to find out, is he the real Messiah, right? And so Nicodemus, Nicodemus <laughs> says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he, en- can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Right? Good question. Like when we say being a new creation, what's that mean? And how do we become a new creation? Like what's that look like? Can we really be born again? And Jesus answers him and he talks to him about, hey, we were born physically from our mother's womb. But Jesus tells him it's about being born in the spirit. It's about a spiritual renewal, a spiritual rebirth, being born again. So if we're going to be in Jesus, we need to be born again. We need to become a new creation. We need to accept that the old self, we are no longer slaves to that. Our sins are forgiven. And Pastor Drew talked about this during his forgiveness message. We are forgiven. We need to like, accept that and allow ourselves to accept that forgiveness if we're going to let go and no longer be enslaved to our old selves and become the new self which is called to be an ambassador to Christ, who is called to live for Jesus, who is called to uncover these truths around this promise. If we look in the end of our Romans chapter 6 passage, starting in verse 9, Paul tells the church in Rome, We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. 
For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's my hope for our church, you guys. That we would grab onto this promise that we can be made new. That we would, with Jesus, allow ourselves, as that passage says there, we must consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So that's my hope for you guys today. Thank you guys. Will you pray with me as we conclude?